background about myself. Um, I've worked MCS for over seven years. Um, I previously sort of prior to that worked as a sort of postdoctoral researcher. Um, so that's sort of post PhD uh, research um, in sort of climate change um, and looking at sort of how we reconstruct um, past kind of climate events. So, um, and I, I really sort of changed to work in the sort of charity sector with the Marine Conservation Society because I wanted to do something um, a little bit more sort of hands-on and sort of direct in terms of what's happening to um, the environment uh, today and, you know, how we can kind of change it. And I think, you know, one of the, the very sort of unique things about the Marine Conservation Society is, you know, it's a, a UK-based charity. It is uh, focused sort of on UK and also UK overseas territory. Um, so, you know, we're very kind of focused in terms of what we deliver. So a lot of the time, the places that you're diving, you know, those are the places that we're trying to kind of conserve. Um, so, you know, it's quite unique in, in the work that it does. Um, so I head up a, a small team um, who work on sort of um, to do with kind of pollution. Uh, we have sort of main areas of focus um, are sort of looking at um, plastics. We're also um, in the last sort of 18 months started to do some additional work on sort of chemicals. Um, and we also do some work around uh, working, um, looking at sort of water quality and You'll see all of those aspects actually reflected in, in the microfibers talk that I'm giving this evening. So it's really quite something unique um, actually to bring together all the strands of work um, that the team focus on sort of within this. So I'm hoping that, you know, I can give you some introduction. Obviously, some people, you know, might have quite a lot of knowledge about this. Some people might have very little. Um, so hopefully I can sort of take you through the kind of story of why it's important, what we can do, why we should, as the sort of title talks about stopping at source um, and sort of kind of next steps. I'll also sort of provide some sort of hopefully insights to some of the, the lobbying, some of the information, um, some of the aspects that we've done. So, you know, it'll be kind of a, a broad brush approach, um, but hopefully uh, one that will be of interest. Um, I'm sort of hoping that it'll be about 45 minutes. You will see occasionally I'm looking at my phone because uh, I have no timer here. Um, so I, I will be sort of keeping um, sort of roughly on track in terms of time um, to make sure you've got enough time that, for any questions, because I think quite often people find that that's the most interesting part of the discussion. So what are microfibers? So microfibers are, are the sort of the word that we use for the bits that sort of fall off our clothes. Um, it's sometimes also called fiber fragmentation. Um, you won't hear me using this term very often, but that's the industry preferred term. Um, and this is basically, you know, if you think about all the clothes that you kind of wear, they're made up of fibers and these fibers break. Um, so if you um, think about how cotton is sort of made, you know, that's all the fibers kind of put together. And actually, one of the things that, you know, quite often I get, get asked is, well, what happens, you know, when I wear a cotton T-shirt versus, you know, something that's made from kind of plastic? And I sort of say, well, actually, the cotton T-shirt um, has a lot more kind of fibre fragmentation. You can think about if you, as you're growing cotton, you have to kind of weave it together, um, whereas plastic, you get a long kind of stretch. But the important thing is that impact that it has on the environment. And so tonight I'll be talking mostly about kind of uh, sort of plastic fibres. I will touch a little bit on sort of um, semi-synthetic and sort of natural fibres. So this is a sort of lovely picture um, just of what those fibres look like, but probably most of them, uh, you've seen them as, you, you know, you're taking your washing out, uh, uh, you know, those little bits of dust, that's what they look like in terms of uh, under the microphone, uh, under the microscope, not the microphone, the microscope. So when we're thinking about sort of, you know, how and what causes, you know, um, microfibers to get into, I'm going to focus today sort of on one of the kind of direct routes, talking about laundry. Some of you might have seen recently that um, uh, the study looking at sort of microplastics in the home. So I'm just going to focus sort of much more on that kind of laundry and that direct uh, thing, just because otherwise we'll be covering too many aspects within a kind of 45 minute kind of talk. So, you know, when we wash our clothes, as you can imagine, you know, they're going into the system. Well, what happens um, to do with that? So there was a study done um, in, in 2020, which started to look at um, the sort of emissions from um, 
different kind of uh, sources. And, and what you can see is that this is the microfiber emissions that, and this is synthetic. So, and that's important because when we're talking about breakdown of kind of plastics, you know, there is sometimes scientists who argue um, that actually, you know, plastics never really breaks down, that it just gets into smaller and smaller and smaller bits of uh, plastic. So as you can imagine, you know, as you're um, increasing the amount of synthetic material that's being used, you're going to increase those emissions to the environment, but also you're not going to see those em emissions being biodegraded during that time. So you're going to see this cumulative kind of emissions. And what you can see is, you know, in the 60s, we had very few kind of synthetics being released. And what you can see is that dramatic kind of increase. And you can sort of see roughly, you know, also by kind of fiber types, you know, those that are kind of, um, you know, polyester being one of the, the most kind of extreme. One of the things I would like to point out to this, because it's something, uh, again, that I get asked, you know, when we look at kind of the emissions, you can sort of see that we've got kind of Europe on there, North America, Asia uh, and China. And one of the, the sort of things about looking at kind of emissions um, is you know, one of the key emissions that we have to the environment is when clothes are kind of produced. So a lot of the clothes that we wear in our everyday are produced sort of in China. So part of those emissions isn't just the, the laundry that we're using when we're looking at this, uh, sorry, the laundry that we do. It's also about the, the emissions or when the clothes are being manufactured and also potentially when they're being recycled. So the recycling rate of textiles is incredibly low. Um, estimates are about less than 1%, 1% to 4%. 4% is the highest I've ever seen uh, quoted, um, but typically normally people quote around 1%. So, you know, they're, they're very low kind of um, textile recycling. So most of those emissions are coming from kind of production, laundry, etc. So I've got a couple of videos in here, so I'm hoping they're going to work. Uh, now I decided it doesn't want to move at all. OK, so, um, you know, when we're kind of um, putting our kind of clothes into a washing machine, well, what happens uh, with that? So um, during the kind of um, as the, the clothes are kind of rubbed against each other, um, sort of part of the washing process is actually the friction. You know, that's how sort of if you think about when people sort of manually wash their clothes it's a friction that really sort of gets the dirt off gets the grease gets the grime off and that friction is also generating those microfibers so you know there's recommendations for helping to reduce um, the amount of friction that you get using uh, liquids rather than powder for example because it reduces the amount of friction that you have um, and that's really important when you're sort of thinking well how do we kind of each and and every step that we're kind of doing, how do we reduce our sort of environmental impact? So what you can see here um, is, you know, that sort of um, emissions from those kind of discharges. And the reason that I kind of show this is um, you can see sort of this is a global kind of picture. Um, you know, we have untreated wastewater, which shouldn't be the case in the UK. Um, I will, we'll, we'll park that conversation for another day. Um, what we can see is it's going through the kind of the wastewater treatment. Um, and then we have this interesting um, sort of 142 uh, kilotons, which looks at emissions um, from the wastewater treatment, it then becomes biosolids, and then you've got land emissions. And I think um, what's the reason for this, and I think many people perhaps they're not aware of it or they've never really thought about it, is the fact that um, what happens in the sewage work treatment is basically you've got separation, um, you've got treatment as it sort of goes through, and the, the actual solid material is kind of separated, and this is the biosolids. And this biosolids captures everything solid, and so it'll catch all the organic matter from the sewage work treatment, Apologies if you're still eating dinner, um, and but it also in this it'll also be capturing uh, microplastics because while the system was never built or intended to capture microplastics, it is in itself a solid. Um, so this is captured within the biosolids, and this um, in many countries, uh, including the UK, um, this is then spread to land uh, on farmers by farmers 
and on land. Um, so what you get is while the capturing of the microfibers happens um, during the sewage work treatment, um, that is effectively those microplastics are then re-released um, sort of um, because this sewage is then being, this treated sewage um, is then being spread on the fields. Now, obviously, you know, the, the very easy conversation would be like, well, why don't we just stop uh, spreading this? Um, if you think about, you know, a lot of the conversations that have been had in the last two weeks talking about sort of climate change COP, actually um, the use of um, sort of biosolids is, you know, is a perfect example of a circular economy. If you think about, you know, more sort of traditional sort of ways of farming, that was a way to kind of bring back uh, fertilization, bring back. Uh, soil structure to your land. So there are sort of positive things about using um, um, this sort of biosolids, but obviously, you know, there's issues around the fact that it is now carrying kind of plastics. And this is why, you know, when I, I chose the, the title of my talk, I very much said that, you know, we should be um, stopping um, pollution at source, why it's really important that we prevent it getting into it in the first place. You know, we need to be moving to a much more kind of circular economy and we need to put steps and measures in place to stop the release of kind of microplastics in this way. So this is where we see if the video works. Um, let's hope it worked in the practice run. So um thinking about it so um so i'm just going to mute that because I, I i don't think you guys can hear um but there is kind of uh, subtitles uh, along the bottom um so and this is really just to go through what i've just been talking about and what i'll be presenting in kind of uh, a bit later in, in sort of the presentation um but it really follows that kind of story of you know, the release of microfibers, you know, every time that we're kind of doing a wash. And, and these are figures that have come from a study done at, by Plymouth University. So, you know, this is the map of that's going into the wastewater treatment system. So, and this is the, the process of, of the sewage being kind of separated into the liquids and into the kind of solids. Um, and then you can sort of see um, this sludge being kind of uh, spread on sort of farmlands. And you'll notice that we also kind of talk about chemicals um, in this process as well. So, but that is a talk for another day. Um, so, and then you can sort of see that obviously these are being released into the environment um, and we're finding those within the marine environment. So this was a, a video that we've got um, associated with kind of our petition and campaign, but I thought it was a good point to sort of put that in. If you're sort of going, oh, this is lots of new information. Um, it's quite a nice kind of video to do this. So hopefully we'll be able to um, go on to the next slide. So those that were kind of eagle eyed will have noticed, um, yeah, that we talked about chemicals within that video as, as well as sort of microplastics. And for those that are kind of really technical, I'm, I'm just going to flag it. Um, we do have a series of um, briefings that are available on the Clean Seas. We actually have a publication uh, page within that um, where we can find much more kind of technical information talking about sewage sludge. And I think it's one of those things that, you know, as a mar marine conservation charity, sort of wonder why are we talking about kind of sludge? But actually, hopefully, I've sort of given you an idea that you know, it's really important, you know, thinking about what we're putting down, what we're flushing, whether or not that is wet wipes, whether or not um, um, microfibers getting in or whether or not it, it's certain chemicals. You know, we really need to focus that sort of stopping pollution at source because, you know, we live in an environment, we are part of the environment. And actually, if you want to move to a much more circular economy, we need to be very much um, phasing out all these kind of pollutants. So. I've talked a little bit about sort of, you know, how they're getting into um, the, the sort of system. Um, so if we kind of look and think about, well, what happens if, you know, um, you know, we remove the kind of sludge component, are we still getting discharges, um, you know, after a sort of post wastewater treatment? It's estimated that a, a, the sewage work treatments removes around sort of somewhere between 95 to 98% of microfibers, um, but we still, that still means that trillions are being released to the environment, you know, every single day. Um, you know, the system was not designed to, to remove microplastics um, and microfibers. 
So what does this actually mean in terms of kind of volume? So I thought this was kind of, um, this is a report produced in 2017. Um, and you can sort of see, you know, this is the total kind of mismanaged waste. Um, and, and what you can see is, you know, um, the report uses a bit of earlier data, but you can see that's looking at sort of 10 million tonnes per year. And then you've got sort of about 0.5 million tonnes estimated um, from kind of fishing gear, from ghost gear. Um, so this is stuff that's either been accidentally or deliberately um, discarded at sea. Um, and then you've got the sort of microplastics, microfibers kind of uh, component. So I've talked a lot about microfibers, but you'll notice here it sort of talks about microplastics. So um, I'll just sort of quickly explain what actually a microplastic is and the definition of it. Um, I appreciate that some of you probably already know this, um, but for those that don't, it's really nice. And one of the key things is, you know, is the definition. So you'll hear the term microplastics. Now, for those scientists out there, you'll be like, OK, it's micro. OK, that, that should be less than one millimeter. Uh, for microplastics, it's not. It's less than five micro, uh, five. And the reason for this is to do with something called pre-production pellets. So if you look in the diagram, you can see something that look, looks like a kind of triangle um, sort of these. Um, th th this is a sort of schematic showing lots and lots of um, microplastic, sorry, um, showing lots and lots of pre-production pellets. And these pre-production pellets make up everything. Um, so every sort of bit of plastic pretty much um, you can use it in slightly different form, but basically most plastic is made from these pre-production pellets. And they're basically little sort of, they look like the size of kind of lentils, and they basically just make it really easy to transport your plastic around. They are melted down and then the additives are added. Sometimes they've got the additives pre-added, um, but this basically makes it really easy to kind of transport around the world. But their size, uh, you've got it, it is five millimeters. So when they were talking about the definition of microplastics, they set it as five millimeters. So it's a bit of a quirk. Um, you know, it doesn't quite match uh, normal sort of scientific, uh, you know, definitions. Um, but that's the reason that they, they set it at that. Um, obviously, with um, microfibers are also included in, in microplastics. And again, you've got obviously, you know, some microfibers are slightly longer, um, but obviously they're much shorter in terms of um, their actually kind of their width. And what you can sort of see um, is the relative contribution of different things um, for the microplastic emissions. And what you can see is, you know, it's, it's about a third of the emissions are from microplastics from our clothes. Um, you've got slightly um, smaller emissions um, from kind of car tires and then something called sort of city dust, et cetera, um, that sort of makes up kind of the majority of the rest. So this is sort of slightly zoomed in. It might be a little bit small still on your kind of screen, um, but you can see the relative portion. So, you know, when we're talking about microfiber loss um, to the environment, you know, it's making a huge amount of emissions, um, you know, and the crucial thing about microplastics is that effectively because they're so small, you know, they're, they're available all the way up the kind of food chain. And also, if you can imagine, you know, when you're thinking about sort of clean up and beach cleans, et cetera, you're really not going to hit that point where you can start sort of cleaning up microfibers, you know, realistically, once they're in the ocean, they're in the ocean forever. So, you know, that's why it's so important that, you know, we start dealing with this at source. So when we start to sort of think about, well, you know, these are getting into the environment, they're getting into the estuarine, they're getting into kind of the, the marine environment. What kind of are the impacts of this? And this video seems to have auto played. Excellent. Um, so what you can see here in, in the center is uh, microfiber. Uh, and what you can see is uh, the zooplankton. And unfortunately, um, you have instances where they're ingesting this, which means that, you know, and that effect has on them is kind of twofold. So the first one is obviously they're ingesting this, they're not ingesting food, um, which means that they feel full, they're unable to in ingest sort of um, the nutrition that they actually need, which means their ability to reproduce um, goes down. Generally, their lifespan is shorter. Um, the quantity that they can reproduce in, oh, sorry, the quality of their reproduction is also reduced. So even if they're able to reproduce, um, 
So, and also obviously you can imagine that um, it reduces their mobility, you know, when you're talking about sort of zooplankton, et cetera. So, you know, there are a number of kind of physical effects of that. And then the second part of that is the fact that on these microfibers, you have uh, chemicals um, that either were in the production um, as part of the plastics. Um, so, for instance, um, if you're talking about waterproof jackets, they may have been sprayed with something called PFAS. Um, this chemical is often called a forever chemical. And this chemical basically, it's called forever, you know, it's been nicknamed forever chemical because, well, it lasts forever. It requires about a thousand degrees um, to um, basically break those bonds. Sorry, I'm just going to try and play the video again for you guys so you've not got a black screen. Um, so it takes to break those chemicals down, it takes more than a thousand degrees. So obviously, you're not going to get that in the ocean. So these microfibers are carrying those kind of chemicals. You can also have um, the, the fibers themselves absorb toxins from the ocean itself. They're very good at absorbing toxins. And then, obviously, as you, these zooplankton and other creatures are, are digesting you know, there, there's a potential for those chemicals to then leach out. So, you know, you have multiple impacts. There's the physical impact, but also the chemical impact of them ingesting that. So, you know, it's incredibly important that, you know, we, we start to reduce the amount that's getting into the ocean. So this is <coughs> a, a nice kind of uh, summary. For, it's a bit texty, but it's a nice kind of summary um, to show the amount that kind of goes in and you know you can sort of see you know 690 different species being impacted by marine debris 92% of which is plastic so you know you're looking at a huge range of kind of everything from zooplankton all the way up to you know kind of filter feeders um so you know you're talking about kind of whales so you know everything from the smallest to the biggest um is being impacted by this so that then raises the next question. Um, well, what about humans and kind of seafood? Um, so, you know, if you eat seafood, what, well, what does that actually mean? Well, as you can imagine, you know, if you're a filter feeder and you are, um, you know, filtering through the ocean, um, you're going to come across um, sort of microplastics and um, you're going to be sort of in ingesting those as well. So this is a picture um, of a bivalve and you can sort of see um, those microplastics have been kind of ingested. And it's sort of, you know, there's varying kind of estimates in terms of um, the amount of microplastics that you kind of eat per year. Um, obviously depends on the amount of seafood or if you indeed eat seafoods, but, you know, it's showing that it's all the way kind of through our food chain. So these are reports that, you know, were published a couple of years ago, sort of saying, you know, um, basically reporting exactly that, um, that, you know, that you're going to have microplastics in that. Obviously, for, for fish where, you know, you remove the stomach before you eat, um, you know, the impact's likely to be less in terms of what you're ingesting. Where you eat um, those um, seafood whole um, or where, you know, um, for instance, also like mussels, um, you're going to be sort of obviously not removing um, potentially those kind of microplastics to the same extent. So it's therefore kind of really important when we're thinking about it to, um, you know, being focused on kind of the solutions, you know, how do we actually stop these microplastics sort of getting into the ocean? And, and I hope I've kind of shown enough sort of evidence and, and background of why it's really important that we focus on that kind of that upstream kind of solution and intervening as soon as possible. So the first kind of point where you know we can look at um, developing change is really looking at the clothes themselves. So you know the textile production, and you know one of the sort of key there's two areas of kind of focus. One is at the production itself, um, as you can imagine, huge amounts of microplastics are generated at production. Uh, quite often, these are outside the UK. No, um, there are a few um, limited textile producers within the UK, um, but most is overseas. And we can look at reducing the discharges from those. 
and um, the second is thinking about directly how those clothes are kind of worn. Um, and this is one of the things, not how they're worn, sorry, how they're produced. Um, so one of the sort of things I like to think about is if you think about how your clothes are actually put together, if you sort of imagine a kind of knitted weave, sort of something that goes across, um, you can imagine how tight that is, um, is going to influence um, how much kind of um, plastics is being lost. So the, the direction, the density, um, how long those fibres are, you know, I talked right at the beginning talking about the, the length of fibres. And actually, you know, if you thought about sort of uh, maybe you've bought some uh, clothes um, that, you know, typically probably weren't so um, expensive and you've put them into the wash and when they've come out, you sort of go, oh, they don't feel quite the same. Some of that is probably down to the fact that what happens when these clothes are put together, so when they're woven to put together, they're pressed together, what happens is some of the uh, fibres are not incorporated. So they're effectively just sitting on the top. So the first time you wash those clothes, those fibres that are really incorporated into clothes that are just sort of resting on the top, those get washed out. So you have kind of a big discharge of fibres right at the start of, of sort of the first couple of washes where you're removing those fibres that weren't actually really incorporated into the fabric of the material. So obviously you can start to look at how you produce the clothes and also like the type of weave, so a twisted weave can be better um, and, and reduce the amount of kind of fibres. And, and that sort of becomes really important. Now, as you can imagine, this is incredibly uh, complex. I'm definitely not a textile um, expert. Uh, I've been learning a lot, um, but you know, it, a lot of it is about how you produce the fabrics and sort of the types. But also that information needs to be available to kind of companies. So when they're designing a product, they can say, well, actually, we've got option of 10 different options of weave types, um, production lines, et cetera. We're gonna choose the best from those 10. You know, we're definitely not gonna utilize the worst performers. So if you think of something like you, you get on a fridge freezer at the moment, you know, that gives you kind of grading how environmentally friendly, how, how energy efficient is, is my product, you know, effectively, you know, we need to start seeing that coming in with kind of textile production. And this is one of the things that, you know, we really want to see um, come in sort of under sort of extended producer responsibility, um, you know, in, in the sort of coming years. Um, so the government, the UK government's doing consultation and it's one of the things that we're going to be sort of saying, you know, we need to see that kind of come through. So the companies themselves, have, have, or some companies have already started this work, um, um, putting together something called the Microfiber Consortium. Um, and that's really to, to start um, building a database to understand which fibres um, or which textiles um, have the biggest microfiber loss compared to others so that they can start picking so that they don't actually have to test their clothes after they've been produced. They will choose the fibres based on the database. So, you know, this is starting to kind of build. Um, this has just been launched this year. So, you know, it, actually it says we will launch on September the 21st. It has been launched. And uh, now they need to update their text or I need to update my presentation, not sure which. Um, so that's now been launched. So those companies are starting to access that kind of information. And it's something that, you know, we are kind of working whenever we're working with fashion brands, we are sort of saying, you know, you need to start uh, looking at this information and start making decisions based on this. So this forms sort of um, part of a kind of microfibers pledge for when we're working with kind of companies um, and we're getting them to kind of start making those commitments. So this is, you know, a, a summary of that commitment. Um, again, you can find the paper I just very briefly showed. You can find that on our website. Um, but these are the kind of um, sort of six kind of main asks on that. Um, and this is, you know, testing for your microfiber loss, thinking about the kind of recycling, because obviously at the end of life um, for products and for clothes, um, that becomes really important. What happens to that textile? Is it still uh, leaking um, microfibers into the environment? And, you know, it's really good. So um, number five, you know, it's really lovely to be able to actually say in the in sort of the last four months, five months, um, we're actually, you know, we'll be able to update that. Um, so, which is basically, um, 
I talked about these pellets, um, these pre-production pellets that make everything, all our kind of plastic or most of our plastic. Um, and basically there's a huge loss of these to the environment. Um, and I can talk about that if people have got specific questions about it, but um, particularly if you go to Scotland, um, you, you can literally walk along a tight line and pick handfuls and handfuls and handfuls. Literally there, there are millions on the beaches. Um, if you're diving in the south, you tend to find them a lot less. Um, but again, keep an eye out for them. They're sort of lentil size, they're about five millimeters. Um, and you, yeah, you'll find them on most beaches. So what we want to see is companies who are handling these, you know, employ best practice so they're not being lost to the environment. And we're asking this to go throughout. And Scotland um, has been quite progressive and has been very proactively uh, supporting an introduction of a voluntary standard, um, which is what this is. Um, this was introduced in July 2020. It is a voluntary standard. Um, and as you can imagine, we have hesitations about the fact it is voluntary um, because uh, the plastic industry does not have good form in terms of how it's previously dealt with these pellets. But um, or we will be watching it uh, closely. Um, but I suspect we will be asking for a change and you know, making this uh, a legislative ask. Um, in order that companies reduce the amount of pellets that they have lost, that they lose to the environment. And you'll notice number six, um, we again um, are talking about these forever chemicals. You notice that um, we're asking companies that um, when they make textiles, not to coat them um, with PFAS, this forever chemical, um, so that obviously um, when those clothes are washed, that this is not being lost to the environment. So again, that's you know our commit our ask to companies, and we're asking um, companies to commit to making those changes within it. So I'm just seeing how I'm doing for time. I think I think I'm okay. I'm whizzing through this, but I hope um, it's uh, interesting and good for you guys. Um, so yeah, this is again we've got a nice briefing paper uh, about PFAS. So if you're sort of going, oh, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Obviously, you can ask some questions in the chat. Um, but for those maybe who want to know a bit more technical information, again, we have a, a kind of a PFAS uh, policy paper that you can kind of access that will give you more information. So I've talked a little bit about the kind of textile sort of thing, what we can do there. Now, obviously, you know, even if we get the best um, textiles or we make significant improvements, we're still going to have um, microfiber loss from our kind of clothes and from our washing. So alongside kind of the, the sort of longer term kind of changes in our textiles, we also want to kind of um, have uh, washing machines um, factory fitted with filters. So these will capture the microfiber, uh, microfibers that are being lost when we wash our clothes. And as MCS, we think it's really important that um, these washing machines are factory fitted. Um, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, my DIY skills not the best so you know I, I don't personally want to be like rooting around trying to sort of fix some filter at the back of my washing machine um you know sort of wondering you know is it okay have I done it correctly etc um I, I want to you know get something that you know when I purchase it that I know that it's filtering out these microfibers and we've been doing a lot of advocacy work um around this to really kind of support this ask um from government and this just shows, you know, one of these kind of filters um, being kind of fitted. So this is this would be a sort of factory fitted kind of filter um, that will be in kind of your washing machine. Um, OK, sorry. Apparently I have I'm using a lot of. Um, don't know if that's now working for you guys. Um, so the dye that you can see here is not actually dye. It's actually um, little bits of microfiber filters. Um, and this is then kind of draining out um, through this. So it's not colored water, it's actually like bits of microplastics, pink microplastics. And what you can see is these filters then effectively capture all of this um, within that. Obviously this is a very excessive kind of load. Um, and this is one that the consumer could empty at home um, themselves um, rather than sort of a cartridge that could be sent back. And companies are developing both methods so both the one that uh, customers can uh, empty at home and also ones that people um, can send back and uh, the company then deals with it and effectively 
you know, um, sort of something equivalent if, if people have got, say, Brita filters or know what those are, those kind of equivalent where they're sending those cartridges kind of back and forth. So people often ask me, well, you know, how's that going to affect my bill? Can I afford to have one of these? So um, uh, an article published in the Times, you know, basically kind of uh, was able to, to provide a price for that. And it is estimated that sort of, you know, it would cost about £30 um, for a filter on a washing machine. So, you know, it, it's a relatively, given the price of most machines, um, it's a relatively kind of minor cost um, relative to the kind of machines. And this is a filter uh, that you could use again and again. Um, so this is the price for a kind of reusable sort of filter to be attached. Um, to the machine. And, you know, at the Marine Conservation Society, you know, we really want to understand, you know, how do people kind of feel about sort of paying for that? And, you know, this is just to give you a kind of understanding um, that actually, the you know, a huge majority of people, you know, are willing to kind of pay, well, a quarter of people are willing to pay more than £50 and um, more than half an additional £5. So, you know, when we talk about that is an extra £30, that is the final add-on cost. Um, the reduction cost of that is considerably um, less. So, you know, companies can offer the filters, you know, a bit at a lower cost price should they choose to do the £30 um, reflects the sort of what would be the average add-on cost um, rather than the reduction cost. So, um, you know, and then you can see that, you know, we've got sort of, yeah, over 80% of people, you know, supporting that, you know, our call at MCS for a kind of government legislation to require that all domestic uh, washing machines be fitted uh, with filter. We're asking, um, we're not asking for retrofitting of domestic machines, but we are asking for retrofitting of commercial machines. This is because um, basically a lot of the commercial machines like that were built in the 60s are still going. And we also think that, you know, often they have engineers going to them. So, you know, it, it's a system that could be implemented. But, you know, for a domestic machine, people may not have the space physically to do that. And also it's quite an impractical ask. Um, and the longevity of domestic machines are much shorter than those of kind of commercial machines. So just to sort of um, provide that extra information. So it's not just the UK that, you know, is sort of starting to have this conversation around microfibers. Um, the, in, in France, uh, they've in, introduced legislation. So this is past legislation. So um, it, it is on their statute books um, that as of 1st of January 2025, um, that all new washing machines have to have um, a, a microfiber filter applied. So, you know, Obviously, we get a lot of our washing machines sort of uh, a pan-European. They're not going to make a, a one sort of especially for France and not elsewhere. So, you know, we're looking to companies and, you know, you can start to see the development of um, washing machines coming into the kind of UK um, because, you know, we're being pushed um, partly by France, um, but also, you know, the EU is currently sort of looking at it because, you um, it is looking for also for solutions around the issue that I mentioned about sludge, about reducing at source. And as you hopefully can recall, um, though I appreciate lots of data came up, you know, we're talking over a third of uh, microplastic emissions are from uh, washing machine, uh, from laundry, et cetera. So, you know, if you want to tackle it and sort of try to move us to a more circular economy about use that sludge um, without contamination of microfibers, then we need to kind of solve this issue of microfiber um, pollution. So um, last, I'm going to say last month, it might be the month before, uh, um, the first uh, all party parliamentary group um, produced its uh, first report um, on um, policies on microplastics. Um, so this is um, basically an all-party parliamentary group um, does exactly what you can imagine from the title. It brings across people from uh, different um, backgrounds um, and political persuasions, etc. And so it says, you know, even though we're from different kind of political persuasions, we think that this is important and we should be doing and tackling this. So. 
Um, that's the sort of really important point when we talk about all party parliamentary groups is that actually it divide it goes across the political divides and you know people are sort of expressing interest. So that has a huge number of kind of recommendations. And um, for us, one of the key ones was that um, microfiber filters should be fitted um, by 2025. So this it doesn't mean that it will go into legislation. This is just a recommendation from this group. Um, and you can see in very small print, if you, if you can read it in your version, it says all parliamentary groups are informal groups of members of both houses with a common interest in particular issues. The views expressed in this report are those of those of the group. So, you know, but because it has that cross party support, you know, it's a very good indication of, you know, the potential to sort of bring forward um, legislation. And that's why sort of, you know, at the Marine Conservation Society, we're continuing to sort of, you know, um, asking people to support our kind of petition. We're still collecting signatures. We, we have been doing for a while, but we want to continue that sort of momentum um, as we sort of go into next year. Obviously, at the moment, there's a lot of focus on COP, um, which is great. Um, but as we sort of go into the new year, um, we'll hopefully get a little bit more conversations coming back around this issue of microplastics. So I hope that this has um, been you know, a good kind of introduction, a bit of a kind of whistle stop tour. Um, hopefully I've thrown enough facts at those that, you know, um have uh lots of kind of experience and knowledge in this area but not too many for those that um perhaps are, are, have a little less um sort of scientific backgrounds and hopefully you know you've kind of learned something um throughout this kind of my presentation so i think that's the last slide yep perfect um i've put on um the link to the publications for those that are kind of interested um but i will stop sharing my screen so that i can see the chat and See if there's any questions.